He developed into what we see here on the right, a fully developed human being in about nine months. Of course, this one will grow even 20 years beyond that, but at nine months we have a baby and, well, it has to start somewhere. And along the line, there are a lot of things to change. Um, on the left, there is a 16-day-old embryo. And you might not think it's actually a human being because it's just three layers. Uh, yeah, the mouse works, great. Um, the blue one here will actually develop into uh, the ner central nervous system. It will develop into the brain. The yellow one will develop into the intestines of the body, and the red one will continue to develop into muscles, uh, among other things. So it, you can imagine that a lot of things have to change uh, in 3D. It has to grow to all kinds of dimensions. So and this is a really difficult subject to teach on textbooks, on 2D images uh, to understand. Um, here's another uh, example of the development. Um, on the left most here is at first day and, and the last stage here is around 60 days. This is the Carnegie stages and these are some of the stages your body will go through when developing. Um, and to bring things in perspective, you can see here at what small our data actually is. Um, so how do we want to teach this subject to our medical students? We want to teach the embryonic development through a 3D atlas of human embryology. Um, the project was led by Benedette de, de Bacca, a PhD student, and it's our idea to create a true to nature and comprehensible atlas. Um, partially by students created, uh, I'll go into that a little bit further, and it's supposed to be a 3D digital series and most um, effectively it should be interactable, interactive. Uh, people should be able to take a model, uh, look at the development states and look around it to see uh, how it differs between 20 days and 40 days, to see the changes that have been in progress since then. And you might wonder, how do we get a model from an embryo because the data is so small? Um, well, in the leftmost corner, we have a model, an embryo at around 30 days old. Um, it's actually microscopic data. What we do is we cut it up into pieces, into sections, and we can have a lot of different sections. Uh, they'll vary between 42, and some uh, embryos can go up to 1,000 sections. Um, we'll stack those and we'll throw them into a software called Amira, which will align them for us in this image. And then in Amira, we will segment the embryonic, um, uh, the organs in the embryo. Uh, for example, here in the green, you can see part of the neural tube. This is done by students. It's done by medical students and they will actually go through the uh, sometimes thousand sections of a single embryo and select which part belongs to which, um, um, or to which organ. And then with a mirror we can create another reconstruction, which is the model over here. Um, it's a really boxy model, it's really rough, and it can exist out of a few million uh, polygons. That data is just way too big. So finally we'll be using Blender to do the final modeling and create low poly models that we can actually use to distribute uh, to the students because giving them models of a few uh, million vertices that, that will be just too much data to, to send to them. Um, so you might wonder why do we want to use Blender for this? There's a lot of competition for Blender. Um, well, honestly, we tried a few softwares and I found Blender, um, we all found Blender to be the easiest to do the pure raw modeling for this project. Um, another thing that really helps is the constant development in Blender. I actually saw a few techniques at the conference uh, this weekend that will actually help my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my work. And we have a great community, of course, lots of tutorials, uh, taught me a lot of things. And for the simplest answer, it's the most boring one. It, it's open source, it's free to use. That's one everyone throws at it. Um, so why do we want to use Blender? What can we do with Blender? Um, there's a 
term that they coined at our uh, at, at the work office is knowledge driven modeling. And that is to say that we need a human mind to create these models. The models are organic. They are um, not completely too large chicks that can be put into algorithms. And with Blender, we can do a few things uh, that algorithms are limited with. Um, for example, we can create smooth models uh, while avoiding shrinkets. And with shrinkets, I mean if you take a model in Blender right now and you select all the vertices, you hit a smooth vertex a couple of times, like 10 times, it will shrink a really small part. But you can imagine that with uh, scientific data, we can't miss that. We can't miss those, those micrometers of difference. Um, so we need to have a human mind that makes sure that it, it stays, it becomes smooth, but it stays to uh, occupy the same space as it was before. Um, we can reduce the poly count significantly. Um, the model on the left is actually already reduced from the original data. As you can see, it's already a little bit smoother than the one I showed earlier. Um, but it still clocks in 85,000 vertices. And with the remodeled version on the right, uh, we're already at 17,000 vertices. Um, and that really helps to spread the data around because it, it makes us a lot smaller to distribute. And we can also remove and fix artifacts that we have issues in the model. As you can see in the example here is a few of the veins uh, are actually broken up and the blood can flow through broken up pieces. It can teleport, so we need to have that connected. And a human mind can look into the models and can fix those areas while an algorithm would probably make it worse. And it actually does make it worse. And Finally, some issues are just easier to fix with a 3D, um, a 3D software like Blender. Um, on the left, we have a single model. This has been annotated by the uh, students. Um, they have gone through a thousand sections to see, hey, this part is the aorta, this, this all belongs together. And then when the embryologists look at it, they think, fun. well, the red part is the fused dorsal aorta, but the uh, and the purple one should be the pathos or other because they're not connected anymore. So they need to define those names. And that's something we can do really easy in Blender. We can just uh, create new models out of them with quite some ease, but otherwise they should have to go through all the segments again and see which parts should we name diffused and which ones should we name the paired. So it makes it a lot, the progress a lot easier to do in uh, software like Blender. Um, and yeah, finally, I already mentioned this. Uh, computers are not humans. They are not embryologists. They don't have the knowledge we do. They do what they're supposed to do, and we love them for it. But they're limited to um, actually look at the subject and work with the embryologists to get what we should have. And well, I'm going to go into uh, while showing off some models uh, we made, uh, I'm going to get into some few techniques that really helped me that I found in Blender. It really has sped up our work or helped us solve some issues. Um, of course, we've been using box modeling and sculpting. They're not really interesting here because most people already know about them. But for example, uh, this is a technique we call the Boolean cuts. And this model is actually four parts, it should be four parts. It's actually one model, but we want to divide it in four parts. Well, uh, the embryologists have to go through these segments. We want to skip that part. So we actually want to create the spinal cord, the blue one, and the hindbrain, the yellow one. So what do we do? We get uh, a, pla a flat plane, we place it into Blender, and we place it through the model, make sure it sticks out the model, and then we duplicate it, invert the, ad, uh, the faces so it is divided in two parts. Uh, it looks the other way, other directions. And then we duplicate the original model that's still called NeuroTube, as you can see. We name one part a spinal cord, one part the hindbrain. We add a Boolean with a difference. Um, one uses the first plane, the other uses the duplicated plane, and we get a model that's been cut up. And there's actually a little, um, a hollow area here that's actually intentional. That's one of the nice uh, additions of the trick is that it uh, creates what we want to have and this should be a wall and it is a wall and it's really easy to solve these kind of issues with Blender while well, otherwise we have to go back to a thousand sections and annotate it. That, that's not fun. Um, another trick I actually heard didn't work. <laughs> it's B surfaces. I, I heard it didn't work but it still works in my version 2.71. Um, 
And B-Services is great to create solid models. Uh, the liver is a big solid model, has big flat surfaces, uh, goes a little bit round here and there. And with B-Services, we can grab the grease pencil, draw on it, and quickly generate a surface, and that really speeds up the process of generating. I actually did this in, I think, three seconds, so you can imagine that if we have to do a larger area, it, it will really speed up our development. Um, skin modifier is a great technique we've been using. As you can imagine, the body has a lot of arteries, a lot of veins. And with the skin modifier, we'll take a vertex, we'll place it, if you can see it, right in the middle. Um, we extrude it a few times uh, to make sure it follows the arteries, it follows the veins. And we add a skin modifier and we add a uh, subdivision surface, level two. And we actually get in gray here, we get the arteries quite quickly. It still needs some work done to it, but it will really help us create uh, the models quite quickly. Uh, we also have a lot of clipping issues because organs are next to each other and in the original data these are solved quite easily. Um, you can just select a flat area and you can name it, uh, you can name a few vertices of it will belong to this uh, spa, to the vertebrae and a few pieces will belong to the discs. That's quite easy to do but you'll get broken up models, you'll get non-manifolds and it looks really horrible if you put it into uh, uh, fewer or stuff like that and um, we need manifold models or at least um, mostly manifold uh, in order to not have weird gaps that that don't exist so how do we solve clipping issues with blender we use the clipping board of you to look into an area and you can see the blue disc area is going through the vertebrae um, we select that area, throw it into the uh, vertex group, and we will apply a shrink wrap to it. And you can see it's still coming a little bit through. Um, I, this is uh, coinciding surfaces. They are at the same area, but because of the render, it, it shows a little bit to each other. It looks a lot better when it's into a viewer uh, to show it. Um, and that's a lot of the little things in Blender that really help us with our progress. Like I mentioned the clipping board of view, here's the hotkey for anyone that's wondering, I've never used it before, I want to use it, use it, it's great. There's the OpenGL render that is so easy to do in Blender, just hit a button and actually I created most of the images of the organs here were made with the OpenGL function. We have the decimate in Blender, which is great to reduce the polygon count. We'll lose the topology, and I'll go into that a little bit further, but we'll still have a, a small mess quite quickly. Creating faces in Blender, filling gaps is so easy. You select a few vertices, you hit the F button, and bam, you have a face. Doing that in Maya took me a while for the first time. I had to go to a few menus and find the fill hole function. I got a little bit lost. It took some time, but in Blender it was just F. Every um, function uses it. And if you add the add-on F2, which is one of my favorite, I don't know who did it, but I love you, you get F, 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 bam, get filled. And um, we're doing a lot of reconstruction work. Uh, a lot of, of the original models have holes in them. If you want to repair them with Blender, it's just, Hitting a few times F, um, using the relax function to smoothen it out, and using the bridge tool to uh, to uh, connect two gaps, or using flatten to make it a flat surface. It really speeds up our development. And also one I saw yesterday, uh, copy attributes. I already had it included in my presentation. It's great. Use it if you um, if you have a lot of models that have the same colors, same modifiers really help speed up uh, copying things and doing it manually. Um, do we still have issues? Yes, we always have issues. Um, one of the problems I encounter is when decimating, um, we have loose topology. Well, that's not the only problem, is when we hit decimate too much, uh, for example, we use the original model and want to decimate at 50%, we get, I don't know if it's really, if you can see it, well, it's really difficult to see, and the next shot will see it a little bit better. There are a few glitches here with color, and in the model, you can see that mess is horrible. <laughs> I need to, I re actually want to retopologize this, and I actually saw Jonathan with his uh, retopology on the Blender Market. That, that I'm really looking forward to using that. It will really help me create the, uh, recreate the meshes uh, once more, but then lower. Uh, in polygon count. 
Uh, another example is complexity. This is uh, around 60 days of development and the embryo has been fully uh, modeled. I left out a few models uh, to make sure you can see the guts. Um, and this took a lot of time. Um, it has a lot of faints, it has a lot of intestines. You can, be, you can see the intestines here, the small intestines. Um, well, it takes a lot of time to do this manually. And especially with when looking at a fuel model that hasn't been touched yet, well, that, that will take a lot of time. It will take about five months to do this you know, for one man. Luckily, I always have my assistants working on it. <laughs> so that, that helps me a lot, but even some single models like the veins, uh, you, saw, you saw before, it spreads out a lot. Uh, it's a lot of bits of binary tree areas that have to be solved. And if anyone knows any tricks or tips to help me, please approach me because with some things I'm always looking forward to speeding up the process. And well, I want to show off the app. We actually have it on the iPad as well. Uh, there's an app in development for this. And if you look at it, um, it has two stages in it. And this is the free to use version. Um, this, these screenshots actually have some of the older models in it. It looks better in, in the current version right now. And it's really great to use. And it, I really believe it will help the education a lot to be able to uh, look around the models and see how they differ in, from states to states. Uh, it really helps. Uh, there's a lot of information in there. Uh, there's a lot of people that have worked on this project. I think I missed some people here, so apologies if your name isn't in there. Um, on the right, these are all medical students that have worked on this project, that have learned embryology to this project and uh, have had contributed to uh, creating these segments. So you can see that that's a lot of people working on segmentation. Uh, the group over here actually worked on the 3D models. Um, and that's a really big group that has been working on the models for over two years uh, right now. And we still have a lot of work to do. Um, so that's a fun project. And if you want to check out the app, uh, it's on the iPad. On the, you need, uh, uh, on the app store, I mean, it's for the iPad, iOS 7 Plus, I think, free download. Um, it has two stages in it, download it, look at it. If you're an embryologist and you're interested in the project or you, you're a biologist or anything with medical and you want to know anything about this, feel free to contact Professor Dr. Mormon about it. And if you have questions about how I do my techniques or you have tips or you know something that will help me, send me an email. Uh, I love checking through everything. Uh, and yeah, well, did, did, I didn't make a slide for it, but this is the part where I will ask for questions, I think. <laughs> uh, do you have some of the models available on the website for people to play with or test um, with? Or we don't have it available. Um, I have to check with the embryologist for that, uh, how we do it. Uh, we do have, I think also, um, Good friend of mine has an episode. We can show the, the app around. And if uh, Campbell is not here, I think he's in the other room or upstairs. But one of our Blender developers is really into this kind of mesh coding and uh, he has been looking at a better decimator tool to make sure that you got better topology after doing this. Of course, it should be possible. Right? Yeah, that would be great to yeah. conserve the topology. As, as you saw with the mess, it just really messes up the entire topology. and. I can imagine it will bring some problems in the future if we leave it like that. And also, those kind of development topics are nicely local. Like, it's easier to look at a high quality decimation in Blender, relatively yeah. easier than to fix something like a uh, specific uh, event system thing or linkage and ICIC problems. Yeah. So what I would really like to see is somehow universities that they can find within their own university organization, maybe students who are graduating or working on topology or uh, mass reduction, uh, scanning, uh, conversions, that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of research being done in this area. And we would really like to welcome students to work on those kind of topics and yeah. too. That would be great uh, yeah. if we could solve some issues uh, in that kind of way. Okay, then a quick question. There's a few minutes before the next talk. I can also show the, uh, a few models if you guys want. 
we have any questions. So. Yes, um, this is being done by students. Is it being provided for them just to read like another textbook or is it being integrated into their teaching program? Uh, I have heard it being uh, actually promoted to help teachers into a teaching program. We've had a few pilots at the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam. Uh, I, I think few of the, um, the professors used it in, in their classes or they have shown interest to use it in their classes. So eventually we want to actually use this as a teaching tool as well. Uh, thanks for the presentation, it was really cool. Um, I was wondering, um, have you guys uh, looked at also, um, and that would be very hard, but animating between the stages because that would be very helpful for the learning process I th as well, I think. Yeah, well, well that's a funny part actually. You know, my original internship at the uh, at the office was to actually research the possibility between animating the two stages. Um, we've done a few pilots for that and it's proven to be really difficult because there's a lot of data in between we don't know and the most um, oh, the biggest issue we have is that the polity changes between the two models if you have to model um, take for example the heart it starts in a tube it ends in a four chamber heart if we need to put that all in the same model at, at the start so it can be animated to create that uh, development uh, we don't have the low poly, uh, polygon count anymore. So we're looking forward to a way to uh, create animations and change the polygy at the same way. And I've heard a few ideas being thrown around already. So if you have anything, any ideas about that, also feel free to contact me. Uh, we really want to animate this as well. Yeah, thank you. It was awesome. Yeah.